In the most recent James Bond movie, James Bond was fighting an international organization called Spectre. And Spectre had agents and operatives within every government of the earth, and though they appeared to be serving the government, really those agents and operatives in their hearts were serving and had allegiance toward Spectre. And Spectre had agents and operatives in every nation of the earth, and though outwardly they appeared to be members of that nation, inwardly their allegiance was to Spectre. And Spectre had agents and operatives in every major city of the earth, and even though they appeared to be regular residents of the city, they were in fact agents and operatives of Spectre, whose hearts and minds were aligned to and loyal to Spectre. And so, this organization, this international, multinational organization was hiding in plain sight. Now, the authors of, or the, authors of the script for, for James Bond may have taken their cue from Psalm 87, because Psalm 87 talks about a city, the city of God that is hiding in plain sight. The members of the city of God are members of governments from around the world, but their loyalty is to the king who resides over the city of God. They are members of the various nations of the earth and citizens of the nations of the earth, but in their hearts their chief loyalty is to the king who resides over the city of God. They are scattered among the various cities of the earth, and they serve in its and it's populous and as members of the city, but in their hearts they're loyal to the one who resides over the city of God. The city of God, Psalm 87 says, is the beloved city. It's the city that God loves above all others, and so we ought to want to know what is this city and how can I be a part of it. Open with me to Psalm 87. If you don't have a Bible with you, grab the black Bible in the pew in front of you, and you'll find Psalm 87 on page 494 in that Bible. And as we prepare to look at God's Word, uh, understand that the psalmist is talking about this city that he refers to as the city of God, and he says that it is the beloved city, the city that God loves more than all others, and it's in that city that refreshment is found. It's in that city, in that city alone, that refreshment is found for your souls. And so, the psalmist says that the city of God is a divine city. God is calling it into being out of the cities of the earth. God is calling a nation into being out of the nations of the earth. God is calling a people into being out of the peoples of the earth. It's a divine city. And the city of God is an international city that is comprised of all nations and peoples and and languages, and the city of God is a refreshing city because in it the springs of salvation are found. And it's with that in mind that we'll read together from Psalm 87, and as we read, remember that this is God's holy word. On the holy mount stands the city He founded. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwelling places of Jacob. Glorious things of you are spoken, O city of God. Among those who know me, I mention Rahab and Babylon. Behold, Philistia and Tyre with Cush. This one was born there, they say. And of Zion it shall be said, this one and that one were born in her. For the Most High Himself will establish her. The Lord records as He registers the peoples, this one was born there. Singers and dancers alike say, all my springs are in you. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the Word of our God stands forever. That Word talks about this city of God, this city that is the beloved city of the Lord. And as the the author of the psalm proceeds, he begins by talking to us about how the city of God is a divine city. It's not a regular city of the earth. It's a divine city. It's a supernatural city. It's a city that's been called out by the power of God. And so he begins, on the holy mount stands the city he founded. This gives you an indication that he's not necessarily and particularly talking about Jerusalem itself. After all, the holy mount 
is the city of Jerusalem is founded on a hill, and on the highest point of the hill is the temple, and in the temple is the ark, and on the ark are the wings of angels pointing toward each other, and in between the angels on the lid of the ark in the temple on the highest place in Jerusalem, the presence of God dwelt among His people. That was the mercy seat, the place where God and man dwelt together. But the holy mount the psalmist says, on the holy mount stands the city he founded. But the thing is, the Lord didn't found Jerusalem. Jerusalem was occupied by the Jebusites long before the Israelites entered the promised land, and long before the temple was established there, there was a city. And so, the psalmist has to be looking not simply at Jerusalem itself, but at something greater. And you see this in the the Old Testament, how the physical Jerusalem, the physical Zion, is a physical picture of a greater spiritual reality, of a city that is comprised of living stones that our God is assembling. You see this in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 2 when John receives a vision and he says, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. You see, the bride of Christ is the church, and the church is the new Jerusalem. That means you are the new Jerusalem. You who are living stones comprise the city of God. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 2 and verse 5, you yourself like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house. And so the psalmist says that on the holy mount stands the city he founded. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwelling places of Jacob. The Lord loves the city of God. Glorious things are spoken of the city of God. And it's that city toward which the Old Testament saints looked and pressed. The author of the Hebrews describes the faith of Abraham and the faith of Isaac and Jacob and of Sarah and of the Old Testament patriarchs. And he says that they were look, looking forward, that they, that they weren't satisfied with this earth, that they weren't satisfied with any city that they could find here. And so he says in Hebrews 11, verses 9 and 10, By faith Abraham went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, and heirs with him of the same promise, for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. There is a physical Zion in the Old Testament, but there is a spiritual city with foundations that God is building that is comprised of you, the living stones, the bride of Christ, such that the author of the Hebrews can say in Hebrews eleven sixteen, 16, but as it is, they desire a better, better country that is a heavenly one. Again, referencing the Old Testament patriarchs, they desire now in the present tense a better country, a heavenly one. Not they desired it, they currently desire it because they won't receive it apart from you and me. And when the last person who is ever to be saved is saved, and when Christ returns, then the city will be complete. And we will be complete together, every stone fitted into his or her place in the heavenly Jerusalem, in the heavenly Zion, such that, such that the author of the Hebrews can say in Hebrews 12, 22, you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem. Glorious things of that city are spoken, that city of God that the Lord is creating by calling people out of the nations of the earth and fitting us together as stones in a living city. What are the glorious things that are spoken of the city of God? Will you get a taste of, of that glory in Revelation 22? The angel showed me the river of the water of life, brightest crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and, its, and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. 
Truly, those are glorious things spoken of the city of God, the city that God is calling. And it's a, it's a divine city. God, what, what God is doing in Christ Jesus in history is assembling a nation. He's assembling a kingdom. He's assembling a government. He's assembling a city. Whatever language you want to put on it, this is what God is doing through history, grabbing you out of the places of your birth, grabbing you out of the place of your spiritual death, and in Christ making you alive and bringing you as a living stone into the city of God that he is founding. Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 9, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out. He called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. It is his doing. It's a divine thing. And so the city that the psalmist imagines, the city that God is constructing, the city toward which Abraham and Isaac and Jacob looked forward to, the city of which you are a part, which will will not be fulfilled until Christ breaks forth after having redeemed the very last stone. That city is the one only divine city. It is created by the Lord. It is established by the Lord. It is the divine city of God. Now, one of my favorite scenes in all of of the uh, Narnia books is from The Magician's Nephew. When the young people are taken to uh, an empty place, and there's nothing there. There's nothingness and emptiness and darkness, and they begin to hear a low humming. And the low humming becomes a singing. And the song begins to call forth creation. And the lion, Aslan, is singing. And he sings the trees into existence. And he sings the mountains out of nothingness. And he sings the rivers that begin to flow. Because what he was building was something divine. Now, the Lord is doing something divine in you and through you. He's calling you into existence. He's calling into existence a city out of nothing. And He's making a people for Himself who were lost and broken and enslaved to sin, but who through Christ He's bringing together into the city of God. Paul says something so important in Philippians chapter 3 when he says, our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And let me ask you this question, where is your citizenship primarily? And, and I understand that, that for most of us, we're citizens of the United States of America, sure. You have, you have rightly the desire to seek the best of the nation in which God has placed you, but where is your primary citizenship? Is your primary citizenship here or is your primary citizenship in the city with foundations, the city of which you are a part through faith in Christ? What would it look like if your primary, primary focus were were on the city of God? Well, what would you read primarily? Would you primarily read things about a different government, about a different nation, and about a different city? Or would you primarily read things about this city's government and this city's nation? So, uh, let's think of it this way, and I want you to consider this. The the way that we as American Christians often function is this. I'm going to spend an egregious amount of time reading about and concerning myself about and being very involved in the culture of the United States, the government of the United States, the people of the United States. And this is where my heart is. And so this is what goes across my screen. This is what I read. And it's like this. Imagine that that the people of Namibia, the people of Namibia were fixated upon, fascinated with, talked about, read about the culture and the government and the nation and the people of Denmark. And it captivated them such that they, they spent a little bit of time every week. They gathered together and they, they tipped their hat toward their citizenship in Namibia. And they talked about a few Namibian things. But then over the course of the week, their minds were focused on Denmark. And this is what we do. 
Because our citizenship is in heaven. It is the first calling upon your heart, your time, your thoughts, your focus, your allegiance, your reading. Do you actually function as though you belong to this city or is this city something that happens on Sunday and then during the week? What would it be like if we really recognized that we're being called together as a divine city? I think part of it would be that we would pursue holiness. And I often hear people, it's not wrong to pray for a revival in our nation. It's not wrong to pray for kings and those who are in authority. The Scripture tells us to do it. But often we do so to the exclusion of praying for revival in me. In me. In the house of God. Because what happens during revivals, what happens when the Spirit pours Himself out is that people become concerned about my sin, not my neighbor's sin, my sin, not the culture's sin, my sin, not theirs, mine. And then I begin to pray for God to convict me and to cleanse me. And holiness becomes important to me such that I'm seeking the Lord daily and in His Word daily to seek first the kingdom. Not this kingdom, but the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And what it does is it ultimately cultivates respect in the world. And the world begins to stand up and take notice because the Christians are done playing. They're done pretending. They're done worshiping on Sunday and living Monday through Saturday basically like everybody else because now, now they're beginning to live as though there really is a city to which they belong. Now they begin to live as though there is an actual king and we want to glorify him. What would it mean if we recognized that we were called into a divine city as a divine people, as living stones, we might focus more on that kingdom than this one. We might care more about that city than, than the cities in which we live. We, we might focus our attention on that and begin to care more for holiness inside the church than we do for unholiness outside of its walls. Because if you want to see the culture change, it begins with me. The city of God is a divine city. And the psalmist begins by telling us it's a divine city because then the next thing that comes along is, is flows from that. It's an international city. It's a city that is comprised of people from all the tribes and tongues and languages of the earth. It's a, it is an international city. And so the psalmist says in verse 4, among those who know me, I mention Rahab and Babylon, behold, Philistia and Tyre with Cush. This one was born there, they say. Rahab is not only a person in the Old Testament, but Rahab is also often synonymous for Egypt. And so you have a vision of Egypt in the south, and you have Philistia to the west, and you have Babylon to the east, and you have Tyre to the north, and then way, way down in the south on the far edges of human habitation is Cush, which stands for Ethiopia. And so the psalmist is envisioning people being drawn from the four points of the compass, people who were born there, right? Those people were born there. They were born in various places on the earth. But then he says in verse 5, and of Zion it shall be said, this one and that one were born in her. And in verse 6, the Lord registers the, records as he registers the people, this one was born there. What the psalmist is describing is that regardless of your place of physical birth, you have a spiritual birth into the kingdom of God. You have a spiritual birth into the city of Zion. And it doesn't matter the compass point from which you come physically. If you're alive spiritually, you have been born in the city of God. And you have spiritual birth there. Now Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He cannot see it, he cannot enter it. Replace that phrase with the, the city of God. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the city of God. Now, you begin to see the fulfillment of this in Acts chapter 2, because you remember that when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the disciples at Pentecost, they began to speak in the languages of the known earth, and some people thought they were crazy, and some people thought they were drunk, but, but, as, but as they're explaining what happened, Luke records this in Acts chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphyla, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. 
we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And what happened that day among those people from those compass points? 3,000 were born there that day. They came from everywhere, but they were born spiritually there in the city of God as a physical picture of a greater spiritual reality. And so we recognize some things here. Solomon Kendegore, born in Kenya. Flavio Furlan, born in Brazil. Ernie Tager, born in Germany. Anybody else here not born in the States? Raise your hand. It's okay. Yeah, not born in the States. Woohoo! Doesn't matter. You are a part of the city of God that is being drawn from all the nations of the earth and all the people groups of the world. And though you were born there, of Zion it shall be said, you were born here. Because the city of God is an international city. Now, when Amy and I were in London earlier this year, we had the opportunity to be there for about three days. And I swear we heard 30 foreign accents in three days. 30. We had a delightful conversation with, I don't know, maybe a, uh, some Slavian girl. We, 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 heard, we, we heard accents from various places in Europe. We heard accents from Asia. We heard accents from Europe, from Africa. We heard some southern accents. Uh, there, there were people from all over the world in London. But the city of God is not just a city that has immigrants from other places in the world, but it has immigrants from other places in the world who were spiritually born there. Because the city of God is an international city. What would it look like if we really believe this? And if we believe that the Lord was calling people from all over the world, um, maybe it would affect, again, that news feed. Often, I find it, it's hard for me to take my eyes up off of American society, American culture, American politics, and American news. But there are, there are resources out there that you can read about the church in the world, all around the world. Maybe it would help to know this, that yesterday on the continent of Africa, 15,000 people professed faith in Christ. And the day before, 15,000 people professed faith in Christ. And the day before, 15,000 people professed Christ. And tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day, 15,000 people a day are coming to Christ on the continent of Africa. Did you know that 40 years ago, or uh, when, the, when the, the revolution took place in Iran, it was estimated that after the purge took place that there was something on the order of 40 to 50 Bible-believing Christians in the entire country of Iran. And the most recent estimates are there are 400 to 500,000 Christians in Iran today after years of repression and persecution. The gospel will continue to advance and God will continue to save people from all nations and nothing will stop it. I read earlier today one Scottish theologian said this. He said that the gospel is an anvil on which many a hammer has broken. The church of Jesus Christ and the city of God that is being built is an anvil. And so if we understood that and we understood what God is doing in the world, how might that affect how you pray? How might that affect the news that you read and choose to put into your head? How might it affect how you spend your money? recognizing that now is the time when in America we have, we have the money and we have the theological resources and other places in the world, Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America and South Central Asia, they are ex the, the, the work of the church is exploding and they're desperate for money and people. Our own mission society has set this goal of 1% of the members of our congregation going into mission. And if you don't think you, you've been called to go into mission, Okay, you can say that to me as long as you've asked God first. And if you haven't gone to him and said, do you want to send me? Do that. And if you think you're too old, you're not too old. Moses was 80 when God called him to go talk to Pharaoh. You are not too old. If you think you're too young, you're not too young. Jeremiah was just a boy when God called to him and said, you're going to go preach. If you don't think that you have the right skill set, the skill set that you have is right. I promise you. 
If you think, oh, well, I don't have any experience in ministry, they've got an entire program for business and mission where you go and you take your business skills and you start a business in a, in a foreign society and you use your business as the way to fund missions and you teach and hold Bible studies in and through your business. If you don't think that you have it, go to God and ask, what do you want me to do to help be the instrument by which you divinely are calling people out of the nations and into the, to the city of God, will you go? You might be called to go to Nicaragua, or you might be called to go to next door. You might be called to go to Serbia. You might be called to go to Schnooks. But I promise you, you are called. Ask the Lord. Ask Him. Ask him, how do you want me to serve? Ask him, what do you want me to do? Because you are the instrumentality by which he is going to the nations. And you know this is what Jesus said, that we are to go into all the earth and make disciples. Call people out of the nations of the earth and into the city of God. How would it change if you actually believe that? Where would your prayers be focused? Not, not just on here, but around the world for God to empower by the power of his Holy Spirit, the work of the church around the world that more hammers would break upon the anvil of the gospel. The city of God is divine, and because it's divine, it's divinely empowered. And because it's divine, there is no part of creation it's not going to touch. And so the city of God is international. And the psalmist says that the city of God, maybe above all else, is refreshing. Look at verse 7. Singers and dancers alike say, all my springs are in you. Singers and dancers alike say, all my springs are in you. Well, you know that in the Scripture, the idea of living water is an important thing in a desert land. Living water, bubbling water, flowing water is very different than stagnant water. Living water gives life. Stagnant water often brings death because it's filled with disease and bacteria, or it's filled with bitterness, or it's filled with salt. But living, flowing water is an important thing. And so David preached earlier this summer on Psalm 1 that the man who delights in the law of the Lord is like a tree planted by streams of living water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Psalm 46 and verse 4 says that there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. Isaiah chapter 12, he he talks about this in, in the sense of drawing water from the wells of salvation. And he has pictured a living bubbling spring that bubbles up in, into a well. You know what Jesus said to the woman at the well in Samaria, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the psalmist pictures the day when all the singers and dancers, in other words, a festival of worship is taking place And during that worship, people gather before the Lord and they say, all my springs are in you. And in the context, the spring means life. It's life. All the life I have is in you. The life that I was given at birth, the life that I was given at new birth, the life and the joy and the abundance that comes from it is only and always found in the Lord and in Him alone. And we will rejoice and say, all my springs are are in you because the city of God is the refreshing city. Now, if you go into the middle of eastern Washington, eastern Washington is dry. It's kind of flat. There's not a whole lot around. It's in the rain shadow of the Cascade Mountains. And in the middle of eastern Washington is a a patch of land called the Channeled Scablands. Great name, right? The Channeled Scablands. And basically, an ancient flood stripped all the the soil off, and they're just jagged bits of basalt, jagged bits of old hardened lava across a huge swath of eastern Washington. There's nothing there. Hardly any plant life grows. There's no animal life. There's no water. It's just barren, except for Rocky Ford Creek. Rocky Ford Creek springs up out of the ground in the middle of the channeled scab lands, flows for three miles and disappears. But the life that that spring provides is amazing. Some of the best fly fishing in Washington State 
takes place on the three-mile stretch of Rocky Ford Creek. There are hatches that continue all year long. There are deer and there are raccoons and there are hundreds of types of birds, both permanent and migratory, that come through. And there are, there's an incredibly rich, abundant life, diversity of plant and animal life within uh, 50 yards on either side of that stream. Because in a desert place, water is life. And the psalmist says that, that in the city of God is the only place where you can find life, the only place where you can find water. Let me ask you, aren't you thirsty yet? We, we look to satiate our thirst with money. We look to satiate our thirst with material possessions. We look to satiate our thirst with each other, with relationships. And then we just end up bickering and fighting because you're not meeting my needs and I'm not meeting your needs. And, and we're trying to meet needs with each other that can only be met in the Lord. These things amount to the stagnant water, but we need to have living water in order to have life. You see, Jesus is the fulfillment of, he's the, fulfillment of the promise of, of Psalm 87. On the holy mount stands the city he founded. On the holy mount is the place where God's presence dwelt with his people, but Jesus is himself God dwelling with his people. He's Emmanuel. And he will dwell in the midst of the city for all eternity because he is the refreshment. He is the source of the stream. This is the dry and weary land. And I want you to remember that. You are a sojourning people. You are going from this place. This is not your home. This is a place of tents. This is a place to hold on loosely to the things of this world. This is a place through which you are going to get to the city of God, which is where the Lord is with his people. And it's dry, and it's weary, and there's heartache, and there's sorrow, and there's loss, and there's death, and there's strife, and there's warfare, and this place is parched. What do you need when going through a parched place? You need water. Water is life, and Jesus is life. Do you have him? Are you drinking from him daily? What would that look like? Are you reading from his word, engaging with him in prayer, asking for the Holy Spirit to live in you and to work through you, and to quench your thirst with Jesus. And I would encourage you if you're not, I've been wrestling in prayer with God over the course of the last several months, asking Him to revive me, asking Him to blow the Holy Spirit fresh through me and to fall afresh on me and to fall afresh on our church and to fall afresh on our leadership been wrestling with him, and I find that it is a wrestling match. I find that I struggle to maintain concentration in prayer. I find that it's hard to pray the same things again. I find, in fact, that it's a form of warfare. It's a fight to pray for refreshment. It's a fight to pray for holiness. It's a fight to pray for revival, and it's a fight in part because the more I pray, the more the Lord reveals to me just how much I need Him. The more I pray, the more I see how sinful I am. The more I pray, the more it's exposed to my heart just how cold I am and what an unprofitable servant I am and how dependent upon Him I have even to have the desire to go about the business of praying. But don't stop wrestling. Don't stop praying. Because it is not only a form of wrestling, but it's a form of drinking. And it brings life to you here in this weary land. Because the, the city of God is the only, it's the only refreshing city. It's the only place where your thirst will be quenched. Of course, because, you know this, because... Because he is a super sleuth, because he is a super spy, because he is a super operative, because he is a super agent, and because he always wins in the end, of course, James Bond single-handedly took down the multinational nefarious organization known as Spectre. And so Spectre collapsed. 
Whether it's a real city or a city within a city, every city will collapse. Rome collapsed. One day St. Louis will collapse. Atlanta will collapse. Paris will collapse. London will collapse. Johannesburg will collapse. One day the kingdoms of this earth will become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. Every city will topple. But nothing will topple the city of God. Because even as verse 5 says, for the Most High Himself will establish her. Are you able this morning to say from a full heart and with joy, all my springs are in you? If so, will you please pray with me? Our gracious God and Father, we thank you that you are forming us into a city. The city is divine, it is international, and it is oh so refreshing as we gather together to partake of Christ. And Father, we pray that you would bless us now as we prepare to approach the table where we see him sacrificed on our behalf, he who is our manna in the wilderness and our water from the rock. Father, help us to live consistently as those who belong to this city, to this government, to this nation, to this kingdom in Christ who is head over it all. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.